Hello, welcome to the first uh, math tutorial on my channel. Uh, we're going to start with a lesson in what is called trigonometry. And so this sounds like a big word, like it's going to be something really difficult, but it's, it's nothing to be afraid of. Um, to translate this literally, it says triangle tri as in three, gone as in amount of sides or number of sides, triangle, measure, as in triangle measurement, right? Uh, so we're going to be taking measurements of triangles. Uh, you'll find that it actually doesn't have so much to do with the actual lengths of the sides, so much that it has more to do with the, uh, the size of the angles, the measurement of the angles, um, but we'll get to that to define a couple of functions that we're going to be using throughout our study of uh, trigonometry. And you'll slowly see uh, stuff go off the top. I've got my board here, I'm just pushing it around. Um, and as I need more room, I'll simply just push it down. And if I am going to erase anything, I'll let you know. Everything that we define is going to be defined based on right triangles. You will later see that we can extend this to other triangles, uh, all triangles in fact. And then uh, trigonometry as a whole, as a study, will be uh, more um, easily understood in the context of circles, actually, which seems a little strange going from triangles and measuring those to jumping to circles, but once we get there you will see exactly what I mean. So first we have to start off with right triangles though. So we draw a right triangle. Right triangle is a triangle that has a single right angle in it. It couldn't have more than one because if it had two right angles, if it had two right angles, then those two angles would add up to 180 degrees and you wouldn't be able to wrap around and get a third angle. So only one right angle, uh, and this is a right triangle. The fact that these two legs look the same is uh, irrelevant. I just drew a, an arbitrary right triangle. The fact that they look the same is irrelevant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little arc here in this angle because everything that we do is going to be from the perspective of this angle. We will reference this uh, angle up here, but I want you to understand we could have just as easily picked this angle. Right, these are both just the non-right angles in here, uh, in this triangle, because this is the right angle, which makes this side the hypotenuse, and these are the legs, right? And so, first thing we have to realize is we don't actually have the Pythagorean theorem yet. So I will be proving that in a later video. I'll be showing a handful of different proofs for it. Of course, to prove something, you only need one proof, and then it's done, but multiple proofs yields multiple methodologies. So that's why it's um, important to have more than one proof of something. So we can't assume anything about what we know about right triangles like Pythagorean theorem or anything like that. Um, so we gotta start from basics, start from scratch. So we're gonna label this angle right here, we're gonna call it theta, the Greek letter theta. It's like a zero with a horizontal line through it. Now, because we know that at the very least, the sum of all the angles in every triangle is the same, and we just happen to call this 90 degrees, right? That means that this angle here has to be what we call complementary to theta. Complementary means that two angles add up to give us 90 degrees. So because this is already 90 degrees, and the sum of all three angles in a triangle is 180 degrees by definition of the degree, that means these two other angles must also add up to 90 because then we'd have 90 plus 90, which gives us 180. So this has to be, this angle right here, has to be 90, degree, 90 minus theta degrees. Because if we take a look, What's 90 minus theta plus theta? Well, the thetas cancel, and we get 90 back. And 90 plus 90 is 180. So if this is called theta, and this is 90 degrees, then this has to be 90 minus theta. These are complementary angles, because this plus this is 90. Right? That's what complementary means. Two angles that add together to give 90 degrees, to make a right angle. If you put them next to each other, they would, they would make a right angle. I'm sorry if I keep messing up my hand position here. The camera's above me. And I'm and looking down at the board, so when I do this, I'm holding it to myself, but I really should be doing that. So I, I just got to get used to that. Um, this is the best setup that I can actually <laughs> give myself right here, and I'm actually going to have to go in to the thing and flip the video around because it's upside down. Um, yeah, so um, we're going to do everything from the perspective of this angle. No matter which angle we pick, uh, this side across from the right angle is always called the hypotenuse. Okay, so we're going to abbreviate that HYP. And the, ang uh, the side across from the uh, angle that we've considered is called the opposite side. So we're going to abbreviate that OPP. And this one 
is the one that is next to the the leg that is next to the angle we've chosen. But uh, next is not a fancy enough word, so we're going to go with the word adjacent, right? And we're going to do ADJ as an abbreviation. So from here, we're going to define a couple of functions, okay? Functions of this variable, of theta. So whatever this angle is, this is the input of these functions. Understand that. It's not some value x, like on a, on a real number line, like on the xy plane. It's this angle. And so you can imagine that it's got to go between 0 and 90 degrees, right? But it can't ever equal 90 degrees, because then we'd have two 90 degree angles, and those themselves would add up to 180 degrees, but a triangle has to have three angles. So the third angle would be way off at infinity, because these would be parallel if we had two 90 degree angles. And so that wouldn't really make a, a valid triangle. Um, we'll see that that won't actually make a difference later on when we finally generalize to circles, but for now, you can see that the angles really only can vary between 0 to 90 right now. Uh, later on, we will see that we can do more than that, but for now, it's just 0 to 90. And so we're going to define two functions. We're going to call one of them the sine of theta, S-I-N-E of theta. And we're going to abbreviate it S-I-N. It may seem a little strange to abbreviate something that's four letters down to something that's three letters, but all of the other ones have longer names, and we're going to abbreviate them all with three letters, and so this is just for consistency. So we still read this as sine of theta, despite the fact that it's sin. This is not the same as S-I-G-N sine, as in plus or minus, right? That, if you ask, like, what's the sine of a number, like what's the positive or negative sign, that's called the Cygnus function, S I G N U S. I think it's probably Latin. It's got the the English word sign in it, but it's called the Cygnus function. And if you do Cygnus of a of another function, it tells you where it's positive and where it's negative and where it's equal to zero. And that's what that's for. This is a different sign. Pronounced the same as the word sign, but it's a different function. Okay? And so this is a function of this angle here. And so this will give us different values as this angle. Uh, changes. But this stays fixed, right? This is a right triangle, so it always has to have a right angle. And this angle, theta, should just be allowed to vary. And of course, whatever theta is, that's going to fix whatever 90 minus theta is, because this is going to be fixed by determining that, because these two angles always have to add up to uh, 90 degrees, right? So, yeah. So sine of theta, we're going to define as take the length of the opposite side and divide it by the length of the hypotenuse, okay? So this is going to be opposite over hypotenuse, right? So we're just going to take that length, whatever it is, and divide it by that length there. And that's our function. And that depends on theta, because if theta varies, then the opposites, if it gets, say, theta gets larger, the angle grows, then opposite side's going to get larger as well. So is the hypotenuse, sure, but their values are changing, which probably means that their quotient is going to change. Allow theta to get really, really tiny, like this angle closes down to here. Well, then the opposite side is going to get very, very small, but the hypotenuse is going to stay about as large as the adjacent side as it comes down like that. So the sine of theta is going to approach zero as theta gets closer to zero. I think we can, can you see that, right? The opposite side would go down, get really, really short, whereas the hypotenuse will be about as long as adjacent. And so a really, really tiny number divided by a number that's staying about the same size is going to approach zero. So we can see that this isn't going to remain constant as we let theta vary. So this is definitely going to be a dynamic looking function, right? Uh, on some level, it's going to move, it's going to change value. Um, and the next one that we do, all of them are going to, by the way, we're not going to accidentally define any constant functions. Here's the next one. So the next one we're going to call, uh, now I don't know why this is called sine, but because this is called sine, I can tell you it's on purpose that this next function is called the cosine of theta, and I'm going to underline co, because that's important. That's an important detail. It's not called that for no reason, and I'll explain that as soon as I define it. This is abbreviated COS of theta, right? Same exact kind of uh, format as that, except this time we're just going to take the length of the adjacent side and divide it by the hypotenuse, right? So this is going to be adjacent divided by hypotenuse. Now, what you need to realize is these all depend, oops, these all depend on which angle you are using as your perspective. From this angle, this is the opposite side, and this is the adjacent side. But from this angle, from, from 90 minus theta, the complementary angle, this is the adjacent side to it, and this is the opposite side to it. But they are labeled opposite and adjacent from this angle's perspective. But understand that despite the fact that this is labeled opposite and this is labeled adjacent, if we're looking at it from this angle's perspective, this is the leg that is adjacent to 90 minus theta, and this is the leg that is opposite 90 minus theta, right? Despite their names, that's what they are with respect to that. That's important. Because if I take the sine of theta, 
the sine of theta, which is the, op the side opposite theta divided by the hypotenuse. This is the side opposite theta. We divide it by the hypotenuse. If we then take the cosine of 90 minus theta, what does that mean? Cosine is the side adjacent to the angle divided by the hypotenuse. But what side is adjacent to 90 minus theta? The, the, the side labeled opposite, right? Which is still just this length right here. So we see that the sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. And the cosine of this angle, 90 minus theta, the complementary angle to theta, is the, is, the, is the length of the side adjacent to that angle, which is labeled opposite, divided by the hypotenuse, which is the same value that we get when we do the sine of this angle. So the sine of an angle is equal to the cosine of the complementary angle, which is why we put co in front of it, just like complementary, complementary, right? It's in the word, C-O at the beginning. So this is an important labeling. That means that we have equality at complementary angles for these co, we'll call them co-functions. So we have that the sine of theta is equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse, which is clearly equal to the cosine of the complementary angle. And you will see that when we define other functions, they're also going to have co-functions. And this property will hold for anything named like some trigonometric function and then the co-trigonometric function. They will always have this relationship. We're going to define two other regular trig functions and along with that, two other co-functions that go with each of those that have this property that if you do, if you apply one of them to one of the angles and then the complementary one to the complementary angle, you get the same number. It's the same value. That's why they're called that. And so that's going to be important. So we've defined two functions now. I'm just going to erase this and we're going to go on to define our next function. Okay, so we have these definitions of our two functions, sine and cosine, and they are simply functions of this angle theta here, right? So we're going to define one more function, and it's simply going to be called the tangent function. Now, if you've ever taken uh, high school geometry or algebra 2, or even if you're up to calculus at this point, and you're just kind of uh, going through the motions with these functions. It's not called tangent for no reason, and it has everything to do with what you've learned about tangent lines to specifically circles, right? Remember, recall what a tangent line is. Ooh, that's not a bad circle. But uh, if we have a circle, right, and we have a line that comes in and just touches it at a single point, this is a tangent line of the circle, right? So that's what a tangent line is. And this is called, this function is called the tangent of theta, for a very related reason, I'll say. And we'll see that when we finally get to circles, right? So tangent of theta, abbreviated, as you could probably guess, T-A-N, tan of theta. Now, there's going to be two ways we can really define this. The way I'm going to do it now, and all the others are going to fo follow from this, I'm going to define it as sine divided by cosine. So take this function, whatever it is, and divide it by that function. You'll find that everything from here on out is in terms of these two functions. Later down, way later down the line, you'll see that cosine can actually, well, um, we saw that they, they, they evaluate the same thing at complementary angles, but with just theta as an input and not 90 minus theta as an input, you will be able to write cosine in terms of sine. It's a bit of a cumbersome conversion. Your best bet to understanding stuff is not to just put everything in terms of sine, but to put everything in terms of sine and cosine. And that's how we're going to define every function from here on out. It's going to be in terms of sine and cosine. So tangent is the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta. But what are the sine of theta and the cosine of theta? Well, what did we define them as? Remember, these are just definitions. These are not facts. We have made this up, right? That's what math is. It's made up stuff that's, that's good, useful tools for describing the world. And uh, people go to space using this stuff. So it seems simple at first, but it's absolutely mind-bogglingly important to the modern world that somebody figured this stuff out. So how did we define it? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, which means the numerator of this fraction is opposite over hypotenuse. So we can write this as opposite divided by hypotenuse, and that's just the numerator of this fraction. The denominator is cosine, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. And so we can make the entire denominator of this, the adjacent side, divided by the hypotenuse. Right? It's simply this over that divided by this over that. In the numerator, we have a factor of 1 over the hypotenuse. In the denominator, we also have a factor of 1 over the hypotenuse. What we're going to do is we're going to cancel these divisions by multiplying the top and the bottom of the function by the hypotenuse. And look what happens. That cancels with that. 
that cancels with that, and we're left with opposite over adjacent. And so that's our definition in terms of the side lengths of the right triangle. So the tangent of theta is just this length divided by that length. The sine of theta is just this length divided by that length. And the cosine of theta is just this length divided by that length. Now, there is a mnemonic that is used to help students remember this relationship. There is a way to remember these definitions. Now, I want to emphasize this mnemonic. That there's no, it doesn't contain any mathematical facts. It is simply a way to remember these definitions, because that's all these are. These are definitions. And so now we have the new one, tangent of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, because it is sine over cosine, right? Now, the mnemonic is to take the first letter of all of these and put them together. And it is SOH, CAH, TOA. So ka toa. This is, if you remember this and you can remember how to spell it, then you can remember these definitions, right? This is just a mnemonic. This carries no mathematical baggage whatsoever. It's completely free of that. It's just to help you remember. There will be a nicer, more mathematically relevant mnemonic that I'm going to give uh, at the end of this video. We just have a couple more functions to introduce. Um, but after that, you know, you can more or less get, you know, I, I get, not get rid of this, but this is a good way to remember. I, I guess I can't, I can't fault it. It's, it's a good, it's a good tool. Um, but just understand that it, it has nothing mathematical in it. It's only to remember these definitions of these functions, these three functions. Okay.